Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of The Print Crosshairs, the program where we discuss the big national security issue uh, of the week. I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Avinash Paliwal, uh, scholar, uh, historian of India's intelligence in Afghanistan and in uh, what he calls India's Near East, um, and one of the best informed people on the Indian intelligence community. Um, I'll get straight to it, Avinash. First question, uh, we've seen all these sort of acrimonious words exchanged between India and Canada over recent weeks, uh, over India's alleged role in the assassination uh, of a Khalistan activist. Uh, is this something that is going to be a durable blow to India's intelligence relationship with the West or a storm in the teacup or somewhere in between? Firstly, thank you for having me here. I've been an avid follower of your work on Indian intelligence and security affairs. So the pleasure is all mine to be here. In terms of your question about the durability of the, this, this issue, I think there are two or three elements to this. First of all, intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies anywhere in the world, whether it's between allies, between partners, or between definitely between uh, adversaries, uh, the quotient of trust is always minimal. So this element of you know having a big blow in some sort of a operational relationship between Indian intelligence and those agencies of the West, I doubt this will create a huge, uh, massive sort of a uh, of a dislocation in that space, especially on issues on which these countries are aligned. Right? When you are looking at China, when you are looking at countries such as Pakistan, as far as India is concerned or wider sort of you know strategic play in the Indian Ocean region, I do not foresee any serious dislocation on that count. And I do believe Indian planners did keep that, must have kept that element in perspective when curating their response to the allegations that are coming from Ottawa, um, regardless of you know the, the, the weight in the, of truth in those allegations. So I think this would be, you know, this would not dislocate, but in terms of the intelligence culture and that's the other element it does i think it does have an effect in terms of how strongly or in what you know what is the caliber of um, adversarial relations that you can possibly have even among partners as far as intelligence is concerned if not the broader relationship and i do think this is something on which uh, india and western countries will struggle dealing with each other moving forward there would be increased caution let's say between the Western intelligence, the Canadian intelligence agencies for sure, and, and Indian external intelligence, but also something, someone like CIA or SIS, the British intelligence, I think they'll be much more on their guard when they are dealing with India, especially on issues on which there is political friction, right? Diaspora. Right. So I, I want to draw you out a little bit on that question. Um, some I think in Indian public discourse, some embarrassment or confusion around the question of, is it legitimate for India to use force or use uh, what some people call offensive covert means in pursuit uh, of its perceived interests? Um, leave aside the question of whether this particular assassination was conducted by India or not, which we don't have an answer to and may never have an answer to. Leave aside the question of whether uh, or not uh, Hardeep Singh Nijjar was a legitimate target. Uh, in general, though, um, is it legitimate for India to be pursuing these kinds of objectives uh, overseas? Because this is a new conversation in the country. This is, you know, it's a new conversation in India, Praveen, and it's a new conversation only because this is an allegation coming from a Western capital. But as you know it, as anyone who's focused or studied India's security affairs, especially in the subcontinent, this is not new for India, right? This, you know, India as a country, it's, you know, it's operating, I mean, these agencies are operating in a very unforgiving security environment as far as the subcontinent is concerned. And I can be fairly certain that, in, that India has executed kind of covert operations, even of the offensive caliber in India's immediate neighborhood at different points in time post-independence. So I think what we are seeing happen as of now is not really questioning the role of covert operation in the kind of security toolkit of a state. That is very legitimate part of statecraft. 
every country does that to different levels of successes, to different levels of capability at different points in time. The Americans and the Israelis have a they have a global scale of covert operations, tried, tested, exposed, many of them not exposed. Uh, so I do not think this is really a question necessarily of legitimacy. I think this is, this is something which countries do. This is something India, which is a rising power, uh, very assertive in some areas, uh, is likely to continue doing. I do not think this allegation will rock the faith among Indian intelligence leaders to stop doing this, right? Uh, perhaps the discussion or the fulcrum of discussion would be, okay, how to do it perhaps better or how to uh, maintain secrecy. And this is where I think the politics of secrecy becomes much more salient. And I think that's the element that we need to kind of, you know, unpack a little bit more. Look, you're looking at relationships which are which have endured over time based on certain norms, international norms, uh, based on certain rules, certain regulations. And even within the intelligence sphere, certain kind of unstated understandings, uh, which I was hinting at in terms of intelligence cultures, you do not uh, undertake covert operation inside territories of partner nations. Or if you do, you make sure you don't get caught or you don't expose yourself deliberately. Those are two, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter whether you you do it by choice or or, or by, you know, it just happens. Uh, and I think this politics, politics of exposure is very important because if you get exposed for whatever reason, then you're really putting yourself in an awkward position in terms of, first, you're, you have reputational costs. Are you a serious player who will be, uh, you know, respecting the sovereignty of another country? You would be respecting the territorial integrity of that country, the citizenship landscape of that country. Um, and if not, then it starts, you know, it, it raises question that, okay, if you have done this once, when will it stop? Where will it stop? If today it's Niger, according to from the Canadian perspective, tomorrow it could be anyone else. Today you are, you know, how you define terrorists, how you define militants. What if tomorrow, you know, the, uh, someone in India says that, okay, anyone who's any dissenting voice uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the diaspora of any caliber is, is, is a threat and we need to neutralize this threat. And if the offensive covert option is the only way, then we do it. We have seen this happen with autocratic regimes like China, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, different points in time. India is nowhere close to that, of course. Uh, but the question of where it stopped becomes salient among the minds of Western policymakers going forward. So that remains the case. That's a concern which I think we must uh, focus on, even internally in India. With so I'll, I'll break that up into two parts, if I may, uh, for, our, for our viewers. And the first is the question of competence. So as India's uh, global intelligence footprint, if you like, has increased, which is very normal with a, with a growing power, uh, we've seen a growing number of these cases where uh, there's, there's been allegations or court trials coming out of these operations. Uh, so we have the ongoing trial of eight uh, Indian uh, business executives, former naval personnel in uh, Qatar, uh, we've had a string of allegations come out of Germany and some convictions of uh, alleged intelligence assets, uh, a number of instances of jockeying and shoving and push pushing uh, between the services in the United Kingdom, Canada, a number of other places. Um, one of the allegations, as you're aware, that's been made is, look, the Indian spook services are too police-dominated, uh, too uniformed in their uh, approach uh, to really do this job properly. Would you would you agree with that appraisal? So let me let me respond to that question in two parts on the question of competence. First of all, we need to look at you know competencies over a longer period of time. I do believe that a country like India, which has risen, which is rising now in a particular peculiar manner, where the political leadership is actually telling its intelligence leaders to use, to develop capability, to use force uh, in areas which India has traditionally shied away from using force, if not intelligence gathering, right? Whether it's in the West or even in Southeast Asia or other countries. I think that I mean, necessarily increases the scope of risk of exposure. And I think that is partly we are seeing happen in all the allegations, whether in Germany, in UAE or elsewhere that are coming out. I think uh, that also raises the question in my mind, how many cases have not been exposed, right? And that that balance, I would never know sitting outside. Right. But that's, 
But in for an internal policymaker or a practitioner, this is something that balance needs to be kept in mind. The second element is of you know the, the aspect you mentioned about policing cultures, which you know, as we know, the IPS dominates India's intelligence recruitment landscape. Um, does that necessarily hinder both intelligence gathering and intelligence practices? See, my I have been split on this. I have been torn on this particular aspect. I you know yeah I am. A, I personally, this is I speak for myself, believe that the RAS cadre, which was dedicated towards, you know, India's external agency, RNAW, I think that should have been empowered. And that is something that the founding kind of leaders of India's external agency, you know, whether it was R and Mr. R and Kao, K Sankara Mayor, I think they did see the value of that. That kind right. of right. If, if I'm not wrong, I think Indira Gandhi was quite specific that she right. didn't want this to be a police service. No, absolutely. So, and even not similar to the domestic uh, civilian agency, the intelligence bureau. I think her point was more that we don't want IB, uh, just an IB kind of uh, operational kind of profile in an external setup because that was not helping. In sixties, when RAW was created, it was a very turbulent neighborhood. I mean, sixty-five war, sixty-two war, the Mizo insurgency, the Naga insurgency, also raging at in ebbs and flows, East Pakistan, all sorts of you know, uh, all sorts of issues were going on at that point in time. So there was a need for having specialist intelligence practitioners uh, being developed in-house as far as the state of India is concerned. And that's why the RAS cadre came into being. And yes, it is true, as you have highlighted, that the RAS cadre's kind of numbers have dwindled, perhaps, uh, if not their abilities or capabilities or the kind of training they get. And I think this, uh, having said that, I do believe that, you know, whenever a police officer, uh, at whichever level of their career, when they are recruited into or they're dipped into raw, or they're seconded into raw. I do think they do go through certain degrees of training. They do go through, you know, the element of de-uniforming yourself from the police culture to kind of thinking like a spook, if not necessarily acting. It I, at least there is some attempts which I'm aware of that does happen, and that has been institutionalized. So I don't think that necessarily is the problem. I think here what we are lacking, I personally believe is a larger kind of, you know, uh, global intelligence mindedness is what I call, right? Even a police officer with sufficient degree of training, the moment you start thinking of intelligence as just more than covert ops or just more than gathering hard intelligence, you start, you know, you start looking at societies, Western societies differently. You start looking, you know, the whole, the whole issue starts, you know, gets a different flavor. How do you recruit? How do you execute an operation? And Let's go back to the Nidjur aspect. And for one second, and I'm not kind of saying that the Canadians are right, but for one second, split second, you say that, okay, fine, there is some truth in this allegation. Let's unpack the modus operandi here, right? I mean, there is some, you know, allegedly it was six, six, six men, six men who went ahead in a parking lot outside a Gurdwara who did that. It looks like a gang killing. But look, any, you know, it also says that, look, these are also some of the most exposed groups to Canadian intelligence. So, if, right. Uh, just just to explain that to our viewers, I mean, that would be because gangsters uh, are people who are notorious snitches. Cops keep a close eye on what gangsters are up to. Absolutely. Uh, right. And, and Nijir, as we now know, Nijir was very actively, you know, engaged with, for what purpose, to what effect, I don't know, with the Canadian intelligence services before he was killed. So clearly that's a space that the Canadian intelligence was watching very closely. So for India to, you know, execute an operation of this kind of uh, explosive potential if it gets exposed, um, it raises the question that, okay, something went wrong. That's a, and if it's truly what has been done by, by, by the agencies, then I think there is a need for more thought about how to kind of, you know, operate in Western societies and uh, how to operate also think a bit broad-based, that this is not necessarily, you can't just focus only on the diaspora. Those diasporas are operating in wider social fabrics. Right. Um, and you need to think of that when you're thinking of intelligence operations a little bit more carefully. So, Avinash, one of the, you're, you're sitting in London, which was for the longest time uh, uh, the sort of epicenter of the greatest and finest in intelligence tradition, uh, storied history. And one of the interesting things uh, uh, for me, as you talk about intelligence culture, 
uh, was that the great universities and the great centers of research which the United Kingdom had fed and informed its intelligence culture. If you had people who could operate in uh, Russia or in the Middle East uh, or you know in the furthest corners of Africa, it was because you had a great sort of uh, pool of talent in academia and in linguistics uh, who created the raw material for this. Is India, in your view, doing enough to invest in that wider gamut of uh, knowledge? We talk a lot about it, but not that much seems to happen. So this is actually a deeper issue in my view, Karin. And partly, I believe Indian, uh, the government of India is cautious. They are conscious about this issue of developing linguistic expertise, of developing expertise, you know, getting basic, getting basic social science methods training. I, I personally believe just training someone in social science methods and writing can go a very long way in intelligence analysis and report writing than just kind of focusing them on the detail of the brass tacks of, of information. Right. Uh, so there, there's more to intelligence than, you know, exactly. uh, Mr. Kapoor went from Club A to Cinema B. Uh, Absolutely. Right. What does a club, what is going to a club mean? What is going to a cinema mean? That, that becomes important in my view. You know, if, right. you, if you say that, okay, I want to have a pint a pint of beer in a pub in london that means you're dealing with someone who's probably not a practicing muslim uh, is probably you know the gender dynamics plays in so so all those issues have to be considered more than saying that okay how far the pub is from the target site right something right. like that uh, and i do believe that that consciousness is certainly there in india i think on, we have also seen over the past few years focus on giving mandarin training both to people who are part of the government and the agencies, but also scholars outside in universities. But I think what I personally believe is perhaps lacking or is something that can be developed is, you know, especially when you're do, dealing with Western countries, I feel that there is, uh, there is a need to kind of keep, uh, I don't want to use the term professionalism, but keep information and analysis secular in some way. And when I use this term secular, I don't use it in a partisan kind of political sense, but simply saying that, look, Whatever your political agenda might be, you need a spook who can actually sift through the rhetoric and the reality. And for that, you need to be able to have uh, a, a mechanism of analysis, uh, which kind of looks at, let's say, Khalistan, or Punjabi community or Sikh community in Canada beyond just the lens of Khalistan, which says that, okay, you know, and partly I do believe that, you know, Indian intelligence and Indian leaders are not kind of, uh, that this aspect is not lost on them. But I think this is where, more nuance can be developed. And for that, you do need scholars, you do need an analysts who go beyond just uh, just the brass tacks of information gathering and analysis. And also with that, that also needs, you need intelligence leaders who are receptive or customers who are receptive to that form of uh, knowledge exchange, uh, where you can take a step back and say, look, this is what I believe is happening. And perhaps you need to think a bit harder, let's say, if you're having uh, Navy personnel operating in the UAE, then you need to think about the UAE in a much more deeper fashion than the universities or the departments focusing on West Asia have to offer. Uh, and that is the kind of, and this is where the difference between, I believe, United Kingdom and, and most other institutions, I would say even American, really kicks in. British academia, and this is a big debate for us as academics in Britain, right? British academia is historically privileged very rigorous qualitative analysis. Of course, numbers matter, statistics matter. But at the end of the day, the belief is that, look, numbers can be tortured to tell your story. But you first tell me how you tell the story, what the story is, how do you do the, how do you build that story? I think there's something to be said about that and the wider intelligence culture that has informed British kind of global presence. And I would say continues to inform British global presence till today. So, um... Did we take in India a wrong turn down the road somewhere? I look back and uh, consider the fact that, you know, for all the talk of non-alignment and socialism in the 50s, great relationship between the IB and uh, MI6, uh, in the 60s uh, between uh, the CIA and uh, the Indian intelligence services, 
uh, even you know at the founding days of RAW between French intelligence, you have Cao traveling to Taiwan and having a, a network around the world. Uh, wh why and when did this sort of vision narrow down? When did this sort of diminishing uh, mm. of, a, of, a, of, of our global uh, wings, as it were, uh, take place? That's an excellent question, Praveen, and also not an easy one to answer, I must say. I would have to think a bit harder on this one to be able to give you a historical sort of pivot point. But if I think out loud, if I look at the broader history, first of all, I would pin the causality of what we consider to be a decline, and I hope it's not so, um, but what we consider to be a bit of a uh, demand more kind of, you know, deserving performances on from this front. Uh, I think I would actually say the global war on terror post 9-11 actually reshaped global intelligence practices in ways and means that we actually never understood. Uh, there's a lot of focus on how the CIA went completely, you know, became very armed. It was almost acting like a paramilitary unit rather than an intelligence agency for a good part of the global war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq. And perhaps that also kind of really did damage to the CIA itself. What we miss when we look at it is how the, the, the global environment in which other agencies were performing, operating at this point in time, what impact it had on them. We suddenly see Indian intelligence very focused on Pakistan. We see there's a much increasing appetite of, you know, perhaps exper experimenting with coercion here and there. Uh, not that they didn't do it before, but much the, the appetite goes up. So that, that larger set of that larger environment in which raw and ID began to operate post, I would say, post 2001 over a longish period of time, 10, 15 years. It whetted the appetite of the upcoming intelligence kind of leaders within the institutions um, to be a bit more aggressive, right? And I think to 2014 and 2015, then really the, the political shift within India really catalyzed, you know, it really becomes a catalyst that now you don't have a political leader who's trying to keep you away from doing what you really want to do and what you really want to express. I think it's the two, the meeting of these two broad processes is what leads to a cascading set of exposures, right from Kulbhushan Jadav to UAE naval officers, to cases in Germany, to Canada, to, you know, all sorts of aspects um, where you can see that, look, there is something that has shifted. There's something that has changed. And the best way from for an outsider to gorge is to actually see both the rhetoric that is coming out from the political establishment, the media, and the cases that are coming out from third countries. Um, and that's how, I mean, that's the historian's craft, right? You start pinning these kind of things together to probably get a sense of, put a pin on where, where the actual agency, you know, operations and thinking actually lies. Um, and yeah, I would say that's the broader timeline, uh, the global and the domestic. So, uh, 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 sort of uh, last but one question. Um, this sort of ties in, doesn't it, not with this great admiration or almost envy which exists of Israel uh, in India, saying that, look, these guys have it sorted. And when somebody bothers them, they go and, uh, you know, they, they, they kill X and that's it, problem solved. But it's, it's not quite as simple as problem solved ever, is it? No, absolutely. Look, uh, I think this envy of Israel in terms of its use of force, in terms of use or, or dealing with kind of, you know, dissident, territorial dissidents, so to say, uh, has been a long standing feature in post liberalization India, I would say. I think it's, it's a fairly I, do, I doubt it existed before 91, but I think post 91, 92, slowly and steadily, it is not just restricted to the conservative segments of Indian society or the Hindu nationalists. It's something that is actually quite cross-cutting in that sense. And I think this particular case has, as we can see from the popular reaction on social media and media, has also kind of made people feel that, look, we are, we are actually we are inching closer to that. Right, and we've I been think, at the receiving end and now we're yeah, sticking yeah, one now back. We, yeah, exactly. And I, I would caution against that. Firstly, as you said rightly, this is not as simple as that. Firstly, simply because Israel, you know, Israel is not dealing with a China, a nuclear armed China and nuclear tipped Pakistan on its neighborhood. Uh, it does have its own nukes, but its neighbors don't. So it can afford to provoke. It can afford to provoke with a certain degree of confidence that it, even if it's pushed back, it can kind of escalate, climb the escalation ladder. India cannot. 
That's one thing. They limit to it at least, right? And the second thing is, look, the caliber of Israel's relationship with especially the United States, but also European countries, is very qualitatively different from that of India, right? Uh, whether for whether it's right or wrong, it's a different aspect. But Israel, for historical reasons, uh, is likely to get a lot more room for diplomatic maneuver uh, than perhaps New Delhi would, and even that. As Netanyahu and Obama kind of fraught relations showed, there are kind of limits to that. But the third thing is, and I think that's the most important, as you also hinted, Kareem, has Israel truly solved its problems? And I think that's where we need to kind of really start thinking about. You can do operations, you can use force, but at some point, violence will beget violence. And Israel is learning that the hard way, the psychological cost on Israeli society of being in a permanent state of covert or overt warfare is very, you know, it's very difficult to kind of explain to people in India who are having this envy that, look, that's not a healthy place to be in. Be in. Uh, and as Indians, we don't want to be there. So a final question, uh, Avinash. Till very recently, uh, lots of conversations on where the growing strategic partnership, particularly with the United States, would take India's global intelligence uh, partnerships. Some people were even talking about a kind of associate member or you know, some kind of membership of the Five Eyes. Uh, uh, during the uh, Galwan crisis, American intelligence playing a big role in helping India. Uh, does all this survive this exchange of words and uh, Five Eyes uh, you know, intelligence uh, in the Niger case, uh, or is it is it goodbye for now? I I think the alignments will survive. I don't think that suddenly the Americans will start saying that we will not cooperate with you on giving intelligence or sharing intelligence in China or sharing kind of you know strategic intelligence in the Indian Ocean about naval movements of, of adversaries. I do not foresee that happening because that's very escalatory a step, and that's in no one's interest to be very honest. That will happen. And I don't, I first of all, never believed that India would become an associate or kind of five eyes adjacent ever. I mean, that was something that perhaps, you know, in the in the high of the geopolitical moment, perhaps someone would say that, okay, fine, we are in such a deep alignment with the West that it will happen. That will never happen. The, the genesis of five eyes has a very deep structural uh, political, but partly also racial kind of, you know, elements to that. Kind right. Of it's, a, it's, a, it's a white man's club, if I may put it bluntly. No, I mean, more than white, it's an anglo relationship. Yes. That's, that's, so, so, yes, I mean... Uh, and no, no French or Germans welcome no. either. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and so I think if you're not going to become the associate member anyway, uh, Niger's case would not harm that prospect at all. What, where, and this comes back to the start of this conversation, where it could have an impact is how these agencies deal with you in the diaspora space, which is very politically important to you, uh, for India. And I think that is something to keep an eye out for. Look, these countries, for them, they have been concerned about India and the kind of, you know, polarization of South Asian diaspora, whether it's in Australia, Canada, UK, you know, United States. And I think the major case is really a wake-up call in some ways. And even the violence, Hindu Muslim sort of violence that happened in Leicester last year in the United Kingdom. That has really shaken up governments. So, so I would be increasingly, I wouldn't be surprised if these governments are not just asking, okay, what is Sikh nationalism or Khalistan, but also asking increasingly, okay, what is Hindu nationalism, right? What is the caliber here? What does this mean for India? Uh, so, so I think it's worth keeping our eyes open on that part, part as well. Really interesting questions, lots to consider there. And uh, I know it's a busy day for you, Avinash, but thank you very much for making the time for us. Uh, look forward to having you back on the show. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.